Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we have a special standalone episode, The Shape of Water, directed by Guillermo del Toro. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead. From Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Jason Henderson, author of the upcoming book, California Tiki, from the History Press. With me from Austin is Tony Savaggio, tech director at Rooster Tea Studios, lead singer and bassist to the band Deserts of Mars, and lead guitarist to the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin is Mr. Drew Edwards, editor-in-chief of HorrorMovies.net, writer for Rockabilly Online, and creator and writer of the long-running comic Halloween Man. Say hello, Drew. Hello, Drew. Hello. <laughs> and also in Austin, president of Girls Rock Austin and lead singer and upright bassist of the internationally acclaimed all-female rock and roll band Danger Cakes, whose new album Gloomy Girl is available. Uh, say hello, Jamie. Hello. Hello, and, and, and welcome back. Thanks. So, so it, this is an interesting one. This is the second week in a row that we have done a standalone film, and I think it was because we have we had retro uh, retrospective our, ourselves into just a gelatinous mass, and we needed to take a break and go after some cool standalone films. And we were like, it would be crazy, crazy, not to reckon with this behemoth movie that just made that just won several oscars so uh that's what this is the shape of water is a 2017 american fantasy drama film directed by guillermo del toro written by del toro and vanessa taylor it stars sally hawkins and michael shannon and richard jenkins uh it follows a mute custodian in 1962 at a high security government laboratory who falls in love with a captured humanoid amphibian the american film institute called this one of the top 10 films of the year. It won a lot of nominations at the 90th Academy Awards. It won Best Picture. I mean, Best Picture, you know, like Wall Street. Uh, and it, it, Best Picture, Best Director for Del Toro, Best Original Score, Best Production Design. So when we come to this, we have to come to it with a certain kind of humility. This may very well be the most awarded film, and I'd have to check that, that we have ever dealt with. So um, let's get our opening thoughts. We'll go uh, Drew, Jamie, Tony, uh, and then I'll see if I have anything to, to add to that. Uh, Drew, your opening thoughts, The Shape of Water. Humility, uh, you know, aside, uh -huh. I'm not an Oscars person. I, I, I almost never watch them anymore unless I'm invited to an Oscar party or something. I, I usually read who wins next day. When I first saw this movie, and then I later heard it was nominated, I never thought in a million years it would actually win, because to me, stuff like The Post is what actually wins Oscars. Like, you need to be a little more dry. Mm. And uh, given the nature of this movie, it's very weird and it's very wet. And <laughs> I just, this is a good year for uh, genre picks. At, at the Oscars, not only did uh, uh, Shape of Water uh, win big, but so did Get Out. And, you know, I think that uh, that uh, that's a, great, a good thing for the Oscars to kind of get outside of their comfort zone. It actually made me pay attention for the first time in years. And it's really, really nice. At the same time, this is a very strange, wonderful, offbeat movie. And uh, I, I loved it. I first saw this back in December around the holidays. I loved it then. I just uh, watched it a second time last night uh, there's there's it it, it it only improves on second viewing there was a lot of stuff i noticed the second time around and i just think this is a fabulous movie it's got a lot of layers to it and of course uh, you know there's a lot more going to this than it than it being Guillermo del toro's uh art house version of creature from the black lagoon slash fic like this is a really great movie <laughs> and i can't wait to dig more into it that's really cool. Uh, Jamie, what are your thoughts? I love this movie. I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Um, the scenes are just breathtakingly gorgeous. And I love all the the greens and blues to, throughout the whole course of the, the movie, that, mm. that metaphor. And just in general, like Drew was saying, the, the layers of this movie. And, you know, we've watched it together now twice. And he's right. It's both just so many layers that just keep coming up and different things you notice. And I just love the love story aspect of it as well, even mm. though it's a little, little weird at times. But it's still unabashedly romantic and shows a love that's unshameful. And that is mm. something that's very refreshing. And I think 
that's why it so many people love it so much. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, Tony, where are you coming down? Um, I agree. I, I really liked it the first time. Um, I liked it even more the second time I viewed it. Um, it's very striking. It has a lot of hallmarks of uh, one of my favorite directors and uh, I like his productions, uh, Jean-Pierre Genot. Jean Pierre Genot. Mm. Um, I like City of Lost Children, Mick Max. Um, his films are really great. You know, I like his cast that he keeps. And But it this, although he didn't have a hand in it, has a lot of that production design, I think, um, you know, whether it was on purpose or not. Um, it's a beautifully made film. There's a lot of layers. There's a lot to unpack. Um, it says a lot about um, both the time period it's set in as well as the time period we live in now. Um, it says a lot for misfits and for love and for mm. um unashamedly loving the things that make you who you are and pushing past the things that may have been devastating but yet somehow shape you in ways you know no pun intended <laughs> um in, into what what you are and how you take that and become more than the sum of your parts i guess um i i really enjoy the film and i think there's a lot to take in um i don't own it yet but watching it again i I think I need to rectify that. I, I I think there is a lot to discuss. I mean, I think it it does go very deep and, and it has it has so many layers. I, I um I don't think I loved it as much as you guys did. I I felt like like it is very beautiful and has a lot of wisdom and it is it is a wonderful vision of of mid century America, which I'm a sucker for. There's all this stuff that I'm a complete sucker for, uh, and yet I feel it's about half an hour too long, you know, and and I. You know, I don't know where exactly I would take a cleaver to it, but I I found myself at about 90 minutes in going, what in the world? <laughs> Is this really going to go on for another half hour? So I, you know, and and so I I, I was not under its spell quite as much uh, uh, as you guys were. But I think um, that doesn't take it away away at all from the fact that there's a heck of a lot uh, here to, to discuss. Um, so, and you you may prove I, me wrong, could, by the way. I was going to so say, I could cut reason. some of those Michael Shannon finger scenes. Those were so gross. <laughs> right. <laughs> that um, was right. horrible. The that first was... time I watched... Oh, sorry, Jamie. I, no, no, um, no. It's just okay. Like that's, I, I literally screamed in the theater the first time I saw that. I actually shrieked out loud twice in the theater when I saw this movie um, and this just every scene with his fingers is hard to watch but yeah yeah, yeah it's good of you to remember that you were asking something Tony yeah so I will say the first time that I saw it I kind of see where you're coming from Jason the, the expectation is that later on the heist part would lead almost dovetailing into the end. Yes. For many people. And I think for me, when I first saw it as well. Um, instead, you get a development of the relationship between the creature and basically the world. Yeah. Since he's no longer at the, at the <laughs> facility. And That's so right. I think that part is what you, because you expect it to go directly heist, heist, action, Oh my gosh! Free the creature, right? And we're—I know we're getting ahead, but I, this is just wow. No, you, you've you've nailed it. That's totally true. Because when you but think about it, it, doesn't do that. Yeah, right. Which it doesn't. I think is what makes it interesting. Although it also can make it feel longer because that defies the expectation that you usually have in many movies. Yeah. In a, in a different movie, the heist would dovetail into the Russian yeah. part. <laughs> Which would yeah. go directly into the end. To the end. To the canal. Yes. Right. Uh, and and, and he doesn't you lose do that. He goes, the you know half what? hour. We're gonna, yeah. We're yeah. going to hang out with the characters and we're yeah. going to really develop that. And that's part of what makes it different and I think interesting. But also, I is also where I felt similarly the first time I saw it. And I think that's maybe what you're picking up on. I had none of those problems the second time I saw it. And yeah. in fact, it was like, oh, this... This gives us this area to breathe, and and maybe that's part of what makes it what it is. Is that on second viewing, I I, I didn't feel that just at all, which was interesting because I know exactly. Let's actually where from. that dovetails into I think a really good question, which is why is this movie? And I'm not saying it shouldn't. I'm just saying. Guillermo del Toro made The Devil's Backbone. Uh, he made Hellboy. He made Pan's Labyrinth. He is 
he is, I think, one of the most knowledgeable people in the realm of genre I've ever come across. He wrote an essay at the beginning of, of uh, the Penguin Collection of the Short Stories of Ray Russell that that's just just analyzes the entire genre of, of horror with, with just this amazing clarity. And how is it that this movie, of all of the Guillermo del Toro visions, is the one that becomes best picture of the year? You know, does it, does it, is it better than The Devil's Backbone? You know, or does that matter? Is that even fair to ask? And why? Why is this? I have a, kicks off? I have a, a sort of cynical theory on that. Go, lay it on me. What is it? I think the Oscars were trying to seem a little more hip this year. I really do. I think that that's the reason why you saw this win and you saw Get Out win. Mm-hmm. And I I think that, that you know, that, that over the last few years, we've seen the Oscars criticized a lot. They have started to be kind of seen as something that's a little stodgy. Yeah. So, um, you know. You, and indeed, they changed their voting rules recently. So yeah. the different. Yeah. So so who knows? This might have benefited from that. But go ahead. Um. You know, and I'm not. None of that is to take away how excellent I think this movie is, because I do. I, I, you know, but it, I would feel the same way about it, whether or not it won Best Picture or not. God knows. You know, most, I mean, let's face it, most yeah. of the movies I love do not win Oscars. Yeah, I but, can watch The Blob over and over again, but it's certainly not winning yeah. any Oscars. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But. You know, Del Toro has had a very long career. He, is, you know, even I think the the he's an artist of monster movies, and I think even people who loathe monster movies would be hard felt not to say that the man is a is an artist. I mean, you know, the way his movies look, the way you know they're put together. Like I will take the worst Del Toro movie over a lot of other things because like they're so distinct. Like you can tell he puts so much of himself and what his his passions are up on the screen. I mean, this movie isn't just the, you know even though it does have a lot of you know Creature from the Black Lagoon, Universal Monsters, that kind of stuff in it. Yeah. You know, it, you also have a lot lot of love for other kinds of movies too, like musicals and you know, oh, yes. old old spy movies. You know, things like that. You know, there's a a lot. You know, Tony mentioned the heist movie stuff. Like, yes. This this movie has stuff in it that's going to probably translate more to Oscar voters than some things like, say, Devil's Backbone, but it's also not um, it's not one of his mainstream because he's done a lot of mainstream movies. He did Mimic, he did Blade Two, you know the Hellboy movies, you know, and all of those are very, you know, they're still very Del Toro, but they're all, they're they're more, you know, Tony said it before we started recording. They're more kind of like Marvel, yeah. Marvel superhero style <laughs> things. Yeah, they're, they're much more. Huh? No, I was saying that the the style of this movie, you know, with the whole, you know, we're saying, you were just saying a superhero, but I was thinking more of the surrounding the the whole aspect of the the aqua and the teal and all of the the colors sure. and the water and you know the shape of water but the really the shape of you know what we think should be as opposed to what is and you know i i like the the whole whimsical charm of this movie and that's yeah. something that i feel like we we're just kind of glossing over but like the you know the little musical scenes and the fact that yes. she does have this you know i say amelie like charm but it's really yeah like, Thank you for saying Amelie. Um, uh, that, that, this this is a lot like Amelie. Um, can you, Jamie? Can you talk a little bit about? I think you used the phrase fairy tale. Yeah, and he, and he, Tony yeah. was also saying, and that was actually kind of a big controversy behind this yeah. movie. Was that um, there was um, the other director was saying that he's like, yeah, he basically ripped off my kitchen scene um, in Diner, and you know, and you can totally see that and. At the same point, you know, I don't know if that would be considered ripping off or paying tribute or just, I, I can't say that, you know, one director is going to own breaking into song. You know, it, it just, that seems a little bit trite, but I think the use of that really did kind of make it so much more, like I said, lighthearted and yes. it kind of endeared you to the, the characters all the more um i like i really like the the music with the, the film i i thought like the use of carmen miranda 
and you know it was just it's an endearing you know it's and it kind of gives you that that feel for the time a little bit more than you know just uh an orchestral soundtrack I, I I do love the stuff about the um you know the the fascination with fairy tales. Actually, I, I guess but let's let's put that off for a moment. You're right. We, we were going to discuss the time period, like like where this takes well, place. The um, go ahead, Tony. Uh, yeah, I mean a, a few other things though. Why I think this is became an Oscar film. Mm. Um, it although its time period is what it is. You know, it's the the 60s. Um, it parallels a lot of things. It has a lot of classic, um, what we might consider Hollywood. You know, Jamie hit on it. There's a dance sequence that's very, you know, old Hollywood mm-hmm. in its in the way it's portrayed. Um, Which is the kind of stuff this character carries around. Exactly. She lives, she, she lives with that stuff. Yeah, it's beautifully shot. Um, there's that, it, it even incorporates the element of cinema within it. You know, she lives above a cinema and they constantly mm-hmm. kind of go through that. Um, it has characters who you can, who are relevant today as much as they are, you know, they live in the 60s and have to operate in there. But a lot of that op- operates very similar today. Um, okay, that diner know. scene. Oof. Yeah. I, you know, when, you know, spoiler alert, but when the counter clerk first is really rude to um, the sidekick character, and I, now I can't remember his Richard, name. Richard uh, Jenkins, yep. He, Richard Jenkins, yes, yeah. he's great. Richard um, Jenkins and- plays her. Just to to recap for the for the listener, listener our our beloved um, Miss Esposito has a nice, kindly, closeted gay neighbor who is in love with the hot guy who runs the pie shop across the street. And so Richard Jenkins goes in every day to chat with this guy and to try to see if the guy is interested. But anyway, yes, pick it up from there. Ordering a terrible piece of pie. And ah. I go every day, and then he, you know, finally says, that, and it's not even really a come on. He just put, you know, that gently putting his hand on him and saying how it's so good to talk to someone because he usually works alone. And the guy gets, he turns on him, and it's well. He says, know, "I'd really like to get to know you better." It's a come on. I mean, that's fine. It may have worked. You know, it was worth a shot, and it, and he, it turned out. Uh, the guy was not not having it, but uh, I think his his intentions were clear. I think if somebody said that to me, their intentions would be pretty clear. Um, I don't know. I I feel like I I mean I'm sure like yes, he definitely did have a crush on him, but it just it sounded so sad to science. me the way like and he doesn't really speak to anyone. You know, you, you think about it, and he it's actually you know Eliza is his roommate. They share the apartment. And so, you know, you think about that aspect where, you know, you're having a deaf roommate and working by yourself and he's an alcoholic who's been, you know, it seems like he's been fired from his company or at least kind of run out for. Well, it looks like, I mean, not only that, but it looks like he was around because he and his I don't know if it was a supervisor, coworker had something going Some on. Some kind of falling out. That did not dawn on me. Thank you for pointing that out. I it, it didn't well, dawn that, on me that the reason, reason. The, yeah. the well, impression I, I think always this... got was that something that the guy who's still working there uh, was afraid that whatever they had going on was going to get discovered and pushed him out. Wow, I, that did not Their dawn. Their actions are very much that. Yeah. To, um, wow, that didn't dawn on me either. I just figured he had been a drunk at work or something because he asks him in the big, like when he's giving him the first version of the painting and he's like, oh, are you still drinking? And he's like, no, 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 I'm sober. You know, so I I just uh, totally assumed that I didn't read between the lines there at all and think that they had had a relationship. But But you never know. To me, that always seems. There's a lot of things like that in this movie, but I kind of, I like that about this movie that it leads certain things kind of up for interpretation and kind of you know how do you how do you think it should be <laughs> the, you know. the familiarity they have together and the way that he gets snubbed always led me to believe that that's that yeah. there was a conversation that's just not how this company is mm-hmm. yeah. and that's why he's because they still allowed him to work they're not yeah. they haven't right. ostracized him totally he's still allowed to work and to basically they've just kind of put him to pasture they're not they're never going to approve that painting that's <laughs> yeah. a formality but it's a way to 
slowly wean him away into the ether and let's you know let's just forget about that but i always i don't know even when i first saw it again i could be wrong you know del toro's not here tony that was my read of it too i and i think that's another reason why this is a quote-unquote oscar movie is there's a lot of uh you know they 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 show they don't tell and they let Mm -hmm. you they they let you kind of put connect the dots on your own you know, where, so you don't have to, to connect the dots for the in the diner at all, though. For also, like, not to gloss over the other, you know, the but like, you know, I mean, talk about Black Lives Matter, and talk about the couple that's turned away in the empty restaurant. Absolutely. You know, and it's you know the, just because they're black. And, okay, so this is this yeah. is something that I think is really interesting about this movie is the placement because we watched all those creature movies, right? And they took place in the 50s. And those movies often had a very sort of love-hate relationship with the American government and American scientists. This movie takes place in that era, but has a deeply, deeply cynical vision of the government and and the, and most of the scientists because it's like you know, and, and it comes down to the pie looks good, but the pie is not good. The 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 government people talk about decency, but they don't practice decency. It's something we export because because we don't use it, and that's fascinating to me. Is well, that I thought that was a great line too. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. It's Drew. most sympathetic to people who are on the out outside of this mm-hmm. society. Uh, it, it is most sympathetic to the other. Yeah, uh, you you have you know the the other custodial worker who is an African American woman. You have yeah. the one scientist that is portrayed in a in a more sympathetic light is this is a, is a Russian spy a Russian who spy. now has this very conflicted relationship with his homeland. You know, you have, you know, a, a closeted gay man, all, all people, you know, and there's a, there's a theme throughout this movie of, of everybody not entirely being yeah what they appear <laughs> to be. I mean, and, well, and only this, the but, marginalized are, this may be an, an exaggeration, but uh, only the marginalized are good in this movie, you know, uh, and and the power is generally corrupt. Um, and, and I'm just saying that if this movie came out in 1960, that would not be the case. You would have, you know, to get that kind yeah, of a cynicism, kind of it would have to be a B film. You know, it'd have to be like a like an unusual film, like, like the third creature movie, which was a B film. That was a cynical film. That was more in line with the philosophy that that we're seeing here, although it wasn't a uh, fairy tale. Except, I think you're also seeing um, Del Toro's sympathies for Universal Monsters mm. reflected in how he sees society. Because I think the people well, when Kong Skull Island came out, all right, yeah. um, you know, there was a, a gentleman that interviewed on NPR, and he was talking about uh, the, 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 the the sort of weird relationship between King Kong and race. And I think if we can extrapolate that out further uh, into all the other classic monster archetypes, which is something I think El Toro definitely has an affection for, I think people who are able to sympathize with these characters in these old monster movies who are always, always on the outside of society, I think you do, it does train you to be more sympathetic to marginalized people mm. and it's it's unfortunate that there's a lot of people that that's kind of how how they have to learn but you know better better you get it from somewhere than nowhere at all and, and think, there's also i think the idea of that the people that they're actually fighting against wholeheartedly <laughs> believe that they're doing so for the purpose of the, the good and for one and yeah. all and the american way and you know, one god or the, or the Russian them. way. Yeah. Well, yeah. even well, the Russian doesn't seem to actually be, you know, super. Oh, there's that one idealistic good Russian, and then there's all the bad Russians who are just yeah. as bad and venal and corrupt as as the American government guys. Tony, what were you saying? Well, well, there's several things. I'm actually hitting on that too, but. You know, Del Toro himself has a great love for all of this. And I think that's prob- that's another reason why this movie is what it is and it rings so true. Um, he is a monster kid through and through. Um, he's also, despite the fact that there's cynicism within 
the government, you know, anti-government uh, stuff that's there. There is no cynicism to Del Toro's filmmaking and yeah. what he chooses to make. I've been fortunate enough to see a bunch of Q and A's with him. Yeah. Um, I think he even owns a copy of Clockworks because of a friend of mine. That's but awesome. uh, he he genuinely loves monsters. He genuinely loves these films, and that him not being cynical and his love of it is what comes through that passion comes through. And that's what makes another reason why this film is what it is. The other parts of each, you know, each section of people, each of the governments, each of the uh, outsiders has their own ideology that rings true for them. Mm -hmm. Michael Shannon is not a bad guy (laughs) to himself. Yeah. He sees everything that they're, Everything about this, using it for the government, which he is fully super American. This is how America works. I'm going to buy an American car. I'm going to be super American. He's everything that was the 60s, for yeah. better or worse. Um, well, but, into- Tony, he's still... The, the problem is, though, he is a sexual sadist and a general sadist. No, he's, of course. I'm just... You know, well, also... So that's he, a that's a flaw. In other words, I, I would agree with you that he's a hero in his own mind. That's what I'm saying. But he's also... He has these major problems that... Oh, no, no. That ...are, you know... Well, it's even more interesting that that his, you know, if you if you want not to navel gaze too much, his, you know, early on, uh, it's his fingers ripped off or bitten off or somehow loses fingers to the creature. They reattach, they, they find them, Eliza finds them, they reattach them. Throughout the film, they're rotting, like, you know, Jamie was talking about. Right. That, that mirrors it's the kind angry. of rot that is rotting within this America. Yeah. If he is the ultimate America, it's rotting at the extremities even yes. now as we lead towards, you know, Watergate, towards all of these things. Isn't that you know, wonderful? The, that's, like, isn't that so fabulous? That, that's beautiful. Are, yeah. Are, are, m- make sense as we extrapolate now into the future we're in. Yeah. You know? And I think that all of that stuff is is brilliant. And that they're, they're really, he's ultra- America, the Russians are ultra Russia. They're both not good people, <laughs> but e- but at odds. Even though they're they're very much the same, and which you'll see at most extremists, um, they view they the extremists may view other extremists as, as um, the enemy, but in the end, uh, most of their ideals end up being the same, just told slightly differently which yeah i feel like and, and everybody in the middle just kind of watches and goes why do you guys you guys are saying the same thing it's all horrible why yeah. <laughs> why why can't you see these things i think the the uh doctor you know it's funny because michael shannon calls him bob and he tells the ladies like oh my name is dimitri but he's you know michael shannon's character is so terrible to the doctor oh, yeah. for no reason just to show you know senior like just power over him the and, all the time. Yeah, I, I think it was, you know, really interesting that the, it, to kind of show the doctor in a very three dimensional light. Like he's not just the good doctor who helps her along. He's not just the bad doctor who is a spy for Russia. He actually seems like a very troubled person because he seems like he just wants to be a scientist. And, you know, the the only way for him to actually escape from his country is really to still be under its thumb. And yeah. it's really in his undoing because he ends up killing the guard. And at that point, when you, you know, when at the beginning of the heist, that was when you realize you're like, ah, he's not going to make it. Like, you know, <laughs> it's, well, it's kind of like the, the red flag in most films, you know, or a trope at least. Like, once you kill, you kind of, you know you're probably on the top block yeah no it's it's a really good point you know and and that mp that he kills during the heist is just a regular guy this could be your dad or my dad you know working a regular job being an mp at a at a local government facility and now they're shot in the head or whatever it is you know and um yeah that and and that's very delilah also was another character who i thought was great because they could have that could have gotten really really like you know racially stereotyping really quickly um you know having a, a you know her in a position of being you know a, a maid which wouldn't have been uncommon at the time but still you know yeah. they they're uh, being a, a black woman in baltimore during that time period you know they they didn't really 
do a lot of things they could have done it to really make that character more of a I said a stereotype or whatnot, which I'm I'm very happy they did. Um, it was very respectful, and you know, Octavia Jones is just great in that part, and she's, you know, just I I love the fact that she's this powerful woman and yet such a diminutive face. She's a regular and, person, you know. She yeah. she's just a regular working class person who uh, has her own wisdom and her own problems and. And her her life is going on regardless what the hell happens to Miss Esposito and the, and the crazy fish man. You know she will she'll be here before she'll be here after. You know she's got her own thing, and it's yeah, a and it, it is a it is a neat know. character. I yeah, like the fact that like, she, you know the whole time she's talking about her husband and how he's like no good for anything, and you know the one time that it, it was you know she was threatened instead of him defending her he ratted her out and it kind of, and I also thought that was actually a really poetic scene in its almost disgusting way because it, it touched on a lot of different aspects yeah. with where Michael Shannon comes in and like, you know, basically like barges into their house and then tears off his own fingers in front of her. Because Jenny <laughs> was saying, about yes. the, you know, the whole rotten to the core, like that, idea of America and Michael Shannon is basically representing that and then you know he's able to kind of get the you know her husband to kind of go along with him in almost a way it's a it's very like a chauvinistic uh, representation right. of the time and then you know for him to rip that off in front of her that and have like her own husband basically turn on her well, in that moment was just you know, like I read. Been... I read the husband as certainly out. Just an, it was outrageous as far as Octavia Spencer is concerned. But the husband telling Michael Shannon what he wants to know also effectively gets him out of the apartment because that guy is really threatening, you know. And, and he's saying, "You don't have. We don't have what you need here." But I'll tell you where it is. Uh, you know, he has no now. What is what he does totally wrong? Yes, probably, maybe I don't know. But the uh, um, but it is effective in. I don't care about this problem. I want this guy out of my house, and that's what. So I don't think he thinks of it as betraying her. I think he thinks of it as betraying somebody else, which maybe is just as bad. But um, I, I did want to mention. No. Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Drew. still a rat. He's still being a rat. Yeah, he's a rat. Yeah, no, totally. Before, no, 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 no. We, before we move away from, from Michael Shannon, you know, uh, or, or I'm sure we'll No, yeah, stay on Michael Shannon. Him, I but, thought about yeah, but before, yeah. before we go, I, I just want to say, I actually think of this as, you know, like Tony's right is that he, he, he um, represents sort of the idealized, you know, suburban American, you know, what, what the American dream was at that time and to a degree still is. But I sort of see this movie as you have – you know the the fake America, which is you know whitewashed, middle class, you know uh, you know white family, nice car, you know that mm -hmm. kind of you know stereotyped idea of what America should be. I think it, it's the we also see the real America, which is diverse of of race and you yeah. know of of sexual orientation and you know of, of class kind of lashing back at that and you know it's like funny because like michael shannon i i consider myself to be a very patriotic person but michael shannon is kind of everything i don't like about america and all these other characters are the things that i do when i say like i love my country there is like i'm not thinking about like the michael shannons of the world well yeah but i mean that's that's where that's you know again there's many reasons but what that's part of why you get punk music and other revolution is kids growing up and seeing leave it to beaver mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reality is it's not leave it to beaver it's it's everything else it's it's much more nuanced than that yeah. and it, and a lot of times way darker than that and you you see a lot of things that are reaction this movie has you know my Michael Shannon's character is fighting for America should be that. And and this, he actually doesn't believe it's as for. dark. This is why he survived yeah. for, right? This is yeah. why I fought to Michael Shannon, right? And but to a lot of other people, that's not that's not their uh pursuit of happiness. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's that's not life and liberty to them. Um, they they may never make it to the suburbs. Yeah. Um, and that's the reality of it. There's no, there's no room for the people who are marginalized in this film in the suburbs. That's and right. Michael Shannon would probably fight to keep them out if he could. I don't think he's given any thought. I mean, for instance, you know, we see Michael Shannon go through a a path. He definitely has the sadist side early on, but he really believes that he's doing the right thing. And it's only when he pleads his case to the general and says, listen, I'm trying. And the general says, I have no room in my world for your questions of morality. I'm, I'm a very, uh, you know, everything is just about does it work or do, it doesn't it work. In other words, he opens up Michael Shannon's eyes to how corrupt the system so, he's living in is. So in that same token, and this is what also makes it relevant to today, mm -hmm. and we, we should probably talk about the creature. <laughs> yes. Which Michael Shannon is actually kind of the creature, again, in this, this weird Frankenstein's monster kind of way. However, yeah. so at that crossroads, right, Michael Shannon confronts his boss and says, hey, look, I failed, but I'm really trying hard. And you'll meet nobody who's more American. He is, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but you know, we fought together in the war. You know me. The general goes, all that's hogwash. I'm just, you know, this is the way America works. Really, here's all this stuff. Michael Shannon at that point has a choice. He can own up and go, wow, I have been open to the ways of the world that what I thought was one way is not that way. I should fight for that change against that change. I should reevaluate where I stand. But yeah. like many, many things that happen today, that immediately turns into blaming anyone else. Yeah. There is no self-reflection. There is no right, there's I'm, not. You're this right. is how the world is. This is, you know what? Everyone else but me has made this terrible. I am gonna fix this. I'm gonna fix it by fixing all the terrible things that, that are not me. And and that's that's a lot of the problems. That's again how horror holds this mirror to everything. Like you see this, Michael Shannon could have, his character could have uh, thought, wow, well that means that what I've been fighting for is a lie, which is hard to, to take in. And that's why people don't usually do that. Yeah. That if you don't have that self-reflection or that time, and instead he goes full on the opposite way. Everything else is to blame. It's got to be he the Russians. Down. Yeah. It's got to be like, I, I cannot but, accept an America that's not the America I want. I am I going to fight just them. Patriotism too. Yeah. I mean, it's not even just that. I think it's, I mean, it's kind of like holding a mirror to toxic masculinity. Oh, you know? well, he's the top for that. I mean, it's yeah. awful. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, and even the general beforehand, like, you know, the like, he starts with the, do it for me, son. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, kind of throwing this like dad complex towards him. And then suddenly it's like, well, you know, we're going to disown you. You'll have nothing. You know, if you screw this up, you're done. And, you know, it, it's it's just perpetuating this cycle. And, you know, and even like the jokes, like yeah. there's so few crude jokes in this movie. And they're really only from Michael Shannon. Yes. And of course, it's like, and I found that that one joke that he tells about his finger just disgusting to me like yeah. it's so quick and like just done but it just grossed me out so much and he's an know, interesting to... character yeah what, like uh, also i find it fascinating that boy we haven't talked nearly enough about sally hawkins as the lead but michael shannon is sexually harassing sally hawkins in a time when there is literally nothing you can do about that other than try not to get cornered by the guy because he um, is, yeah, go ahead. And the fact that she's a, a deaf or a woman who she's not deaf, but she's mute. She's and, you know, she has no voice. It's like, it's totally gives it this, you know, little mermaid feel, but in reverse, mm -hmm. you know, and just him just finding that perversion in her not being able to cry out and the fact that he's saying like i bet you i could make you squawk oh. things along those lines it was just it's so timely to you know what's going on with the me too movement right now yes it's like man poor poor eliza like it's just you know that is that is not a good work environment <laughs> no but so but the One fact that, that, like I said, I, I do love that this movie has given the lead part, you know, to a woman who has a disability. That's so rare in general in films, you know, and that's... that's well, you mean the character. I don't think Sally Hawkins... Yeah. No, 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 does. no. I know yeah. she's not mute. But I'm saying in general, like, I, I think that's great, you know, to even have somebody who's yeah. playing, you know, 
it's right. Yet another more mar uh, mar marginalized person. Uh, and, and let's talk for a moment about Eliza. We, we talked about how Eliza is, to me, a little bit like Amelie, this person who's very observant, very sort of in her, and at the same time, in her own kind of fantasy world. You know, I I, I found it, you know, uh, Tony was mentioning she lives over a, over a cinema. She watches old movies with her gay roommate all the time. You know, she's... Uh, she's a very sexual being, you know, and and for reasons that escape me, and I'm not against it. I'm just like I, I, I you know, you couldn't show this movie on the, at the on the ABC Sunday Night Film because we've got this full on full frontal nudity, like within 80 seconds of the movie beginning, because we he wants to include that her daily ritual involves uh, an egg timer's worth of masturbation. I don't even know what this is here for. Not against it. Just trying to understand, you know. If if this were a uh, uh, this kind of just sort of frank sexuality, you just don't see it. At least not since the 1970s. I mean, they basically or in American films, it's it's something that's seen more in European films for sure. But I think that the yeah, frank Pedro Almodovar, that kind of thing, sure. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's supposed to actually normalize sexuality. It's you know, masturbation is a natural thing. It's, it's something sure. that people do. You know, and the big problem with this country in particular is the, the fact one? that we are I mean, so yeah. pent yeah. up and, you know, everyone's telling one person what to do and what not to do that they don't know what to do themselves. And yeah. everyone feels shameful for it. And here we have a movie there in the first, you know, three minutes of the film, you're seeing Eliza, you know, rub one out in the bathtub. Yeah. So, and it's in the bathtub. I think right there, it's kind of setting the the, the tone yes. of yeah, the movie. Yeah, no, actually. absolutely. Yeah. The, well, also, it's an around. egg timer, and you have yes. the theme of like eggs, tub. I mean, the whole thing. Well, right. An egg is supposed to be representative of her fertility, anyways. I mean, that's why we have it, the, you know Easter's right around the corner as the <laughs> Easter Bunny comes. This this movie is extremely <laughs> Maybe well this constructed. Year, the, when... the fish man will come and bring eggs. Yes, yes. With the um, with requisite hand gesture. Yes. The, right. His, oh, like, yeah. there's, a, there's a few things with that. I think, A, it shows that she's she's completely comfortable with herself. Yes. There's no, the fact that she's mute makes it harder in her life, but she's come to terms with that. Yeah. And again, it goes back to also, you know, there's the water, there's egg timer. Also, you know, what you're saying, Jason, that, that does bring up a lot. Why is it? That, so this is a horror movie. It's uh, not a very gory movie. No, it's definitely a genre picture. Why is it that more often we're okay? Like you could you can show a lot of gore. Like look at the Hannibal TV show. Yes, which is just I can't believe it was on network TV. Look at the Stranger Things, uh, the Stranger Things TV show, which has some incredible gore well, at least towards Netflix. the end of the second season. Yeah, yeah but good, point. good point. But Hannibal was on network TV. Yeah, I'm amazed. Why is that? <laughs> Why is the fact that she masturbates in the bathtub the appalling? Oh, we can't show that on TV. Yeah, even yeah, that's it's, more shocking it's, than him ripping off his own finger. I don't. I don't know what the. I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, I and I'm and I'm not. I think bringing you it up. you did find the answer. The idea is that that Del Toro is trying to to show us that masturbation is something that's mundane and that most well, everybody does. And that's great, but. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm more with the sort of strange shock of why is it that we're less comfortable with it? I agree with you, but yeah, well, that's, that's a, but, but the whole <laughs> question of shocking? hey kids, masturbation's okay. That is an unusually off-topic uh, uh, thesis for this film, given why that is it off it's off-topic. This, this this movie has sex. It's all about love. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Why is that? Don't love yourself fish man, before you. Which. Yeah, which so. is is you know not not the norm i would say no i agree yeah. and a and, fishman and, who may or may not be a god in his own realm right because yeah. he can heal people etc um well, and and but, it's it is it is know. troubling to me that i agree with you completely that that um uh the masturbation itself is perfectly wonderful so, and normal and pedro Almodovar did this in tie me up tie me down and there's a problem though which is that by the end of this movie she's going to be full bore bestiality so we're going to go from pretty normal sexual behavior to um to really pretty deviant sexual behavior 
And I, I, I but because wow. it's fairy tale, we're <laughs> asked to kind of go. Eh. So, so okay. So calling it bestiality, yeah. let's let's get into that too. Yes. So okay. Also, by the way, why is that more shocking than Michael Shannon's uh, horribly almost sadistic? Oh, missionary he's position. A he is like, totally. No, he, he, he is, is full on like the the epitome of missionary position, and yet that is covering. way more troubling and terrible <laughs> than yeah, anything no, no. that, that, she, that uh, Eliza like, does with a fish person. I'm more, I'm much more troubled by love. Michael Shannon. You know the the uh, by Michael Shannon's thing, unless his wife is into the having her mouth blocked, but I don't think so. No, no, uh, no, no. He's he's fully like yeah. he's you know he's seen Eliza and he wants that basically. Yeah, yeah. But no. Anyway, so what? Another another point and why it works on many levels. There are many, especially during the '60s. Yeah. You might view, and it's been said worse. There is a potential for someone in the '60s to view a mixed relate mixed race couple in the same way that uh, the fish man lady couple is in this that would not be bestiality boy yes, that's deep. Course, that's this. deep because the problem is obviously they're wrong right you know yeah. whereas but and, there's and, also the but, argument that you're constantly be batting around oh why 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 should we let gay people get married the next yeah. thing you know people be exactly isn't, marry it, isn't it like letting letting people marry fish men right i mean the fish guy in this is not a fish he's no. not a horse it is not a goat it is not he's a actually horse. i guess he's probably kind of a human it would with... be more of an alien and i you know that's yeah. why i say like i you get Humanoid. i mean I'm sure to some to a lot of people he this is semantics and that, that's you know you shouldn't do that to <laughs> well, fish okay this people. is this is this but is, this is part this of is what makes thought. it the movie yeah this is my thought on that like if we're going to take it within the reality of the movie um there's two things i i, I want to say one, this is the way the, the, the monster, the creature is portrayed in this. Like, one, the way he is designed, he is far more human looking than the, the actual creature from the Black Lagoon. He is far more human looking than even Abe Sapien is in mm -hmm. the, the Hell, Hellboy movies. He, he looks almost like if you combined the Gill Man with like a Disney prince. He's very, very no, angular. You know, no, he's he, lovely. He, he's, you he's, thought he's, he was he's, handsome. He's, I mean, he's 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 handsome. I mean, he pretty he's much. Handsome. I can much see a lot <laughs> of like. I haven't searched for it, but I'll bet there's a lot of fa of fan fiction and. Oh sure. You know, porny web. And you know, okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing about that though. He is he is of human intelligence. So you yeah. have the the issue of consent. Like he obviously is consenting to this relationship. Mm -hmm. um, two, there is the question of um, whether uh, Sally Hawkins' character, and by the end of the movie, she is what he is. You know, that, 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 like I mean, we're we're jumping well, over. That's that's totally that's good debatable. point. That's, and that's a there's a question of whether or not she always was that though. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So that's, debatable that's like an up for interpretation it's ambiguous. like we're it's talking ambiguous. about bestiality here drew you're jumping to the end no 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 right. it's fine it's 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 <laughs> fine I, it, I, it, it is related yeah oh well, I'm okay. saying they're the same i could i i, I guess i'm exaggerating for for look just i've written a, i've written a, a comic book for nearly 18 years it's it's all about a woman shacking up with a monster i think in this instance you know i, I i'm always talking you back when you try to use the fairy tale thing in horror as a defense, Jason, but I think <laughs> in this instance, it is absolutely, like, look, if someone gets turned on by monsters, it's fine because this, it, you know, as near as I can tell, this is not going to ever be a real world talking I'm gonna, I, really I'm point. sorry, I want to interrupt for one second because I want to throw out this card here. Tell me, how many sailors and men in the navy and god knows how many other people have ever found a mermaid attractive uh, mermaid yeah, like, what, what that, are they yeah, what is they a, 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 right they're, you know? they're half fish people no no you're totally right you're totally right in other words in legend we embrace uh ideas that in actuality we we might not be for yeah, yeah i i, mean, I, I about, would, uh, pan with you. little yeah. girls are taught at, we're we're taught from an early age, you know, to and maybe it's to prepare us in some ways for what's to come in life. But you're kind of given certain examples with the fairy tales you're given, such as, you know, 
the little mermaid, you know, and I always talk about the little mermaid and when I actually, I give music lessons and we talk about the, the, the main point and the problem with the little mermaid and about how Ariel loses her voice. And then this is kind of, you know, the opposite of that, where it's still this Beauty and the Beast type story, <laughs> but she is able to, like, find a voice with, you know, the, the fish man or whatever, the gill man, whatever we're, we're calling so, it. Um, but, you know, it's the fact that girls are given fairy tales to kind of prepare us for some some potential suitors who may be a little rough around the edges. You know, you think of what that's supposed to show you is coming for you. You know, like Belle has to settle for the beast being a grouch. You know, Eric is only happier when Ariel's not speaking. You know, the sleeping beauty, geez. You know, like you got to worry about potential. What is that? Should it, do I say date rape? Like, are these stories that. Oh, it's worse than date rape in the original fairy tale. In, well, it's you think about up, it, just, like she's asleep. Yeah. yeah. And the well, only way that she's woken up is by someone molesting her, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, if you well, think of these stories, if you want to turn the stories into like clinical thoughts like that, we can do that with but anything. But the stories are you know? the, the stories are multifaceted. We can spin it around and find a way of looking at it that is at its ugliest. We can spin it around and find exactly. it as a reflection of dreams. You know, you, you can you, you can spin it around and find it as a reflection reflection of perverse fantasy that people wouldn't want to admit to. You can spin it around and find it to be uh, a, a cynical way of, of controlling a mass audience. So any, depending, think, yeah, go ahead, Drew. I just think the people getting stressed out about people being turned on by, by monsters, I think that should be, the, that that's not something that, <laughs> like if you were to look at this as like an alleg- allegory, you know, like, like, like for race, or for gender issues or whatever. I think that's perfectly appropriate. And I think that's definitely a lot of that going on here. But looking at this literally, like, oh gosh, we can't have people getting turned on by, by monsters. That's one step up away from bestiality. I mean, come on. I'm well, also, what, right, go ahead. <laughs> the beast is literally a beast. <laughs> yes. And the, we were told that's romantic. Romantic. Why was romantic asking about the, you know, cats and certain his species name. of fish? Is the beast? <laughs> yes, it's well, beauty yeah. and Cats the beast. It's certain... not beauty and the like, kind of sort of grumpy guy. <laughs> it's, not, it's not beauty it's... and the ruffian, right? Yeah. Exactly. He He's... is a beast, and that's yeah. oh wow. You know, let's make several movies. Let's make a Disney movie about that. But fish people, <laughs> whoa, romantic consensual fish people. He didn't. Yes. The, the fish. The the Gilman in this does not hold Eliza hostage in his castle against her will in a bet or in a, in a That's arrangement. Right. He actually like is, are you sure this is okay? Is this, this is cool? Actually kind I mean, of the opposite. Together, like, yeah. She's kind so, of holding him hostage, really. So if you were going to get worked out, go maybe, anywhere. That's true. Maybe the romantic musical with the uh, crazy talking objects is the weirder of the two in an adult uh, environment. <laughs> See, I think if they didn't have the romantic aspects, if, like with the musical aspect of it, and it, let's say she wasn't like a cute little charming, you know, quiet girl, and they had somebody, let's say middle-aged, pushing at least 50s or so, and non-attractive doing the same thing, you basically have like Kathy Bates misery with like a fish man. Like she's kind of in a way, like if you want to go that way with it. Well, I hadn't thought about that, but I I guess that's true. They're in love, like because they have this connection, but really, I mean, what is that? Is that Baron Munchausen proxy when you fall in love? Oh, no, that's when you make your kids sick. What's when you fall in love with your suitor, your kidnapper? Stockholm syndrome. syndrome. What? Hmm? Stockholm syndrome. Stockholm syndrome. Oh, yeah. Um, That's Stockholm syndrome. (laughs) The one where you fall in love with your kids. Oh man, I haven't had an egg in a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, this lady's going to give me eggs and get me all stimulated, you know, but I was worried about her because I was thinking because if you, you know, you can't help but think clinically sometimes. I, I sure. understand you. <laughs> and I immediately was like, I think I know cats 
and certain fish, and including, I believe, dolphins, maybe I could be wrong on this, don't quote me, have barbed penises. And all I could think of was like, oh, my God, like that poor woman, like yeah. does she know what she's in for? <laughs> you know? And, and, and by that point in not- the movie, we're just out in the realm of fantasy. I mean, you know, so so basically whatever you can think of that's not going to be serviceable, har har to that to that fantasy well, can, is not going to can, can we at least thank um del toro for answering the burning question of whether or not the the creature from the black lagoon is a grower or a shower oh. for sure. <laughs> so, by the way i think this design looks a lot like the creature to me i agree with you that it 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 looks very human, human but, looking he has a human but, face he but, but i think that's just an effect of 50 years or whatever it is of of improvement but to me it just looks like an update well, I, think it was intention- I think he, it was intentional though because like if he looked like say like, like that the, the monster squad has an excellent updated creature from the back lagoon but it's much more animalistic looking yeah. than this. you could not do this movie well, with something that was that, that looked as animalistic people I do think people would react much more harshly to that as opposed to this, which is, which is, again, he has a face of a, of a person. Like I'm looking right. at the, I'm looking at one of my pieces of art of the creature from the black lagoon right now. Creature from the black lagoon does not look even remotely as human. Well, you know, it looks you know, like a fish. <laughs> he has like yeah. the face yeah, of like, a, a fish, fish or almost face. amphibian. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that's true. But we also live in a world where there's already been Abe Sapien from Hellboy. Yeah. Which was played by Doug Jones. <laughs> like, but Abe I mean, Sapien doesn't even look as, as human as this guy does. Like, Abe Sapien has, like, a flat face. He doesn't have a nose. Of um, course. But I'm saying that, like, it's he's way more human than the, Cre- the Gill Man. Yes. Absolutely. So, and, and by the way, we should note that um, you said it as far as science fiction goes, you know, the crossing of races in, you know, science fiction is old hat. You know, Spock was was famously half human and half Vulcan, right? You know, and, and that's always in science fiction. That, that's it's it always just jogs on this line back from fantasy to to um a sort of reality that we might like in other words if it is a metaphor for the different ethnicities of the world then we go oh well that totally makes sense if it is literally um a you know a creature from another planet then then we're asked to kind of make more of a leap and and basically what happens is we just we just keep sort of teetering and tottering from one to the other. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that's how it is also possibly of divine origin. Like that, yeah. that takes it to like a whole other level. Like, you know, there's the question of not of whether this, this being is merely just kind of an evolutionary throwback or whether or not he's yeah. some kind of demigod. Well, and, and in fact, we should talk about um, that, uh, the ending and uh, where, uh, after Eliza has taken the creature from where he was being tortured and kept him for a while in her home, eventually he's looking sick and he needs to leave. It's just like he's in a way he's like ET. He can yeah, yeah. heal, you know, but he's getting sick and he needs to be returned to his rightful place. And um, this is the part that Tony said that is now we're back on the Hollywood track and we're headed towards. A, a natural climax to the film where they go out to the canal to drop him in so that he can, in theory, go back to the ocean or what, whatever it is. I, I, I'm not completely certain where exactly they expect him to go, but, but fine. He'll be led into the tributaries of the earth and he'll figure it out. And um, uh, what happens at the end to Eliza? Can somebody explain it to me? And I'm not trying to be stupid. I, I just uh, I would like somebody else to say it also so that I'm just not jabbering. Well, it's up, I feel like it's up for interpretation because she's shot, you know, in, in the gut. And of course, you know, in movie logic, that's also, you know, that's the kiss of death. Like, right. always die. Um, but she basically dies or it seems like she dies holding hands with the fish monster after Michael Shannon also hit, uh, shoots the fish monster twi- or the gill man twice in the chest. And you think he's dying, but then suddenly he does his little, you know, 
healing, recharging, energizing thing and, you know, wipes himself off and he's like, good to go. And then he sees her dead. Um, He's like, oh, and walks over to Michael Shannon and basically slashes his throat. Yeah. Which I loved because I loved that Michael Shannon, after for, for, for all his harassment, of of her, he he ends up losing his voice in the end. I think yeah, that's yeah you don't know favorite that. thing about the this movie. Yeah, you can't oh. tell if he's you know. This is what I was saying about you know. It's, it's up for interpretation. He could you know. It doesn't look like he's bleeding out per se, but he's not able to talk. So you know, yeah. it's not exactly easy to survive having your throat slashed. Um, especially you know he had it. It was also three fingers, just like. You know, yeah. she had on both sides of her neck, just like when he bit off two of Michael Shannon's fingers. Michael Shannon was only left with three fingers. So yeah. it's kind of, you know, that whole uh, metaphor. But then he picks up the, he picks up Eliza and he jumps into the water with her. And then he, this is where I feel like, is it goes, does it go into whimsical fantasy and you're left with a wonderful, happy ending or, is it just a sad way to kind of, you know, like this is what you hope would happen. Like they're reunited after death, but Mm. but she, she seems to be dead in the water, but then he kind of gives her like a little, you know, jolt, you know, he he looks at her side, her throat and she, you know, suddenly a bubble comes out of her mouth and she seems to be awake and alive and able to exist Mm. underwater. So I think it's kind of open for interpretation in that way. But you know, I'd like to think that she, you know, was maybe always a little mermaid esque. You know, maybe she was. They, you maybe. know, in maybe. the beginning, Delilah the says that she. Yeah, so. Delilah says that she was found by the by the river That's with true. her throat slashed. And the way her throat is slashed, it's not a slash right across. I get yeah. three slices on each side, like gills. Yeah. So full disclosure, but another thing, this is, and this is fully in the, I think I've talked about this before, where you kind of bring your own stuff into whatever movie. So years ago, I had a cyst on the side of my neck. It grew to the size of a tennis ball. The cyst is formed in basically whenever you're an embryo, like all embryos kind of are fish-like. Like a fish looks like a chicken, looks like a human, et cetera, right? There's gills there. And that cyst grew from those where basically I we had I had gills as a you know tiny thing before being human. Mm-hmm. And I joked a lot about, hey, I never got cool fish powers or anything. I just got like and they but the incision they make is on the side right there. Mm-hmm. When they're also telling me right before surgery, hey, by the way, if we screw up, we're going to make this cut along your neck. If we screw up, you may not be able to have a tongue that functions Mm. anymore, (laughs) which is horrifying in itself, double horrifying being the lead singer in a band. Yeah. Um, and so like all this time where they're talking about her, you know, be like having these slashes and how terrible that is. And then, you know, everything that's like everything related to that and then the end and all that i'm like for myself i'm just watching this to the fact like sometimes i still like you can they cut along like basically one of the folds in your neck so it doesn't look like i had a you know huge incision there or whatever but every once in a while the sides of my neck where that was tighten up which you can't really tell only i can feel it but like this whole thing of all of that stuff again like for most people it's like oh that's terrible or that's weird or whatever but let me tell you, there's a lot more <laughs> watching this and then watching the end and watching, you know, the way that Michael Shannon talks about her and then how all that happens for me has a whole new level <laughs> of the strange and weird and like, whoa, that's a thing, et cetera. <laughs> Then I think anybody else would, but again, like that's not. I would say there's very few people who have, would have even anything similar to that. And I also, by the way, in that was like Ugh, when you know the Gill Man cuts Michael Shannon the way he does. It's very, yes. it's very uh, karmically rewarding in the way that cathartic horror movies are. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You're like, take that terrible guy. Oh, but shit. you are a god, aren't you? Yeah, 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 no, that was that was really great. Although I have to say, uh what I was thinking about though was the fact that 
just as the corrupt American state nevertheless has a lot of people relying on it, Michael Shannon still has what has a wife and kids who don't deserve to be punished just because their dad is an asshole. And that's but a problem. He, you don't know that he died. Let's yeah. think of, they leave that mm. kind of vague. He could he could just have been off of his voice. You know who knows? Uh, it, uh, I I didn't have high hopes for him, but it it's I'm just saying my mind did actually go there, and uh, but I was just thinking that's just sort of the way the rotten world works, you know, is is that you know stuff happens, um, and yeah, but I I definitely thought about that, but uh, you know I do you remember when we watched Revenge of the Creature? I actually held out hope that after the end, after the creature stumbles in theory to his own death into the sea, that his, his that his water lungs would just start working again, and and he'd be like, "Fuck you, people! I'm going back and I'm growing my gills back, and I'm just going to try to pretend none of this ever happened." And I hope so. and I I also hope yeah. the romantic in me hopes that Eliza and the Guild Man make it back to the Amazon and are revered, or even if they're not revered, that they live out the rest of their lives as a loving couple who yeah. are good together. <laughs> well, don't, I, that's, don't you that's think that this is Del Toro trying to write The Creature from the Black Lagoon a happy ending? Because, oh, I mean, sure. That's what a, a sad point. What a sad character. And, you know, what it, you know. Yeah, but he always plays, do, it's always doomed characters. That's he. He loves tragic figures. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but, but I really I mean, expected that he Pan's would die. Labyrinth. So he gave he us a happy ending. A girl in Pan's Labyrinth. We're yeah. worried about Eliza. We're like, oh, wow. but man, the little girl in Pan's Labyrinth gets mm. it. You know? Yeah, that's well, a truly I, horrific movie. Uh, I have still not seen uh, Pan's Labyrinth. So. It's fantastic. Oh. But... I love that movie. Yeah, no, I know, I, I, I do. I need to, I, I, need, I need to see it. Um, after I finish uh, some of the projects I'm on right now, maybe it'll be time for a Guillermo del Toro retrospective. So, I'm down uh, with that. yeah, yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Um, wow. Well, that takes us through to the end. So, so I think we should definitely, and we've definitely used our time. We should talk about our final thoughts, and we'll come around for. Uh, recommendations. So uh, I believe that what was the order? It was Drew, Jamie, Tony, and then I'll go. So um, Drew, final thoughts. Um, and I know that we could probably keep talking about it for hours, but final thoughts on the shape of water. Well, I, I think almost we could do two podcasts on this one because this, there's just so much in this movie. But I, I think we did a pretty good job of of covering it. You know, like I mean, the makeup effects. I think if I have anything, one of those things that throw out, like man, like like the monster in this monster movie look amazing. And if if nothing else, if you see this movie for anything, see it for the uh, the 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 monster effects. Mocap suit, you can suck it. This is this is the way yeah. it should be done. Yeah. Um, but uh, I I really love this movie. I look forward to getting it eventually on Blu-ray. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime right now. If you you want to watch it, I, I highly recommend that you do. I, it's it's been hyped up so much now, and I'm I'm expecting the backlash to start any second now. If it unless it already has, it might have. Yeah, but, I'm pretty sure um, it has. Yeah. I I think it lives up to the to the hype, and I I I love this movie and I love talking about it and you know I, I can't wait to give it a, a third viewing when when I finally get a chance excellent excellent uh Jamie final thoughts on uh I, think this, I just think this is a great movie I, I really enjoyed it on so many different levels uh not the you know fish porn level like that was okay but you know <laughs> the rest of it I just thought it was just wonderful um it's something that I definitely think people should go and check out. I also think this would actually be like a a good maybe I don't I'm, I don't know if this would be a good bridge movie, but something where if you're looking for something to watch with the kids to explain certain uncomfortable subjects, um, this would probably be a good movie to talk about a lot of them. <laughs> you know, um, and I say that in actually in a positive way. I mean, it has a lot of different things that, you know, a coming of age story would have in them, but it's not a coming of age story. And, you know, it talks about a lot of, you know, problems that people will have out there that we all 
can kind of feel for and hopefully understand and maybe be able to see different people's situations in our own and you know with the use of that camaraderie and find that understanding and you know be able to be better human beings ourselves and be more understanding to those out there um but i do think this is a great movie and said it's absolutely beautiful um and everybody in it is just does a wonderful job uh Every actor, every, you know, the person on the crew, the set design, the uh, cinematography, it's all wonderful. So, I mean, I, I really think this movie earned the Oscar for Best Picture it got this year. So go out and see it. Wow. Or stay uh, in and see it because it's on Amazon Prime. Right, so. exactly. exactly. <laughs> Tony, I mean, how would you wrap it up? I, I really enjoy the film. Um, I did not expect to enjoy it even more on a second viewing. I mean, I knew I would, I enjoyed it. I wanted to watch it. The it's nice when you watch a film a second time and it unravels in different ways um, for you. And I, I found that to be amazing. Um, I think it has a lot to say. Um, I, I think Del Toro giving us a big budget horror movie slash adult uh, yeah. fairy tale is really great. I think also, you know, for me, the fact that we did a creature retrospective yes brought it back around because when this came out we were still i think we were still doing that or it was the tail end of that it, it came out um, i think after we finished our retrospective but not long after so luckily that stuff is fresh in our minds but it, it gave it a lot of depth for me as well yeah in addition to all the weird random kind of meanness which yeah you know, I, I i mean i know that we had some criticism a while back like oh you guys talk too much about yourselves or whatever but just <laughs> I think it, whatever on that, like to me, there there were bits there was like, whoa, this really speaks to me even more because of just random weird circumstances. Um, I love the art direction. I love the cinematography. The you know, of course, the outsiderness of it. I think speaks to many, many, many uh, horror kids out there mm-hmm. um, of horror kids of all ages, of course. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, I again, like I said before, uh, Del Toro has this way of like he takes the projects he wants to make, especially now. Um, I think he'll even have more leeway. Um, he's always a very genuine person um, to a fault sometimes at, at a couple of the Q and A's I've seen, <laughs> um, and I re- I really enjoy his his movies. Um, this was no exception. I think it's tip top among those. Um, even though there are many aspects of his more kind of indie uh, films that where you see an even more raw version of what he really wants to tell. And I think it's cool that he can do a, a, a blockbuster movie as well as a smaller movie that's very, very personal. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy the film. And I each time I watch it, I watched it. It's There's a lot more. I look forward to you know getting and watching it more and hopefully with some extras and if there's commentary or whatever, I, I want to dive into that soon this brought back my uh my love of this flick so Guillermo del Toro is so talented and and um I I've met him extremely briefly and he was just just extraordinarily kind just a very kind guy uh and so you know uh this movie so I I think he's a great artist but I also think he's a very gentle and, and wonderful man and when he talked about why he wanted to make this movie he said that he had come to terms with questions he wanted to grapple with that he, that he hadn't wanted to grapple with when he was younger I think this is a very mature piece of work I mean I think everything connects together all these different things the eggs the sexuality of water the the uh the you know our awareness of the gill man the fact that that stuff happened in the 50s and this is taking place shortly after the 50s all of it you know the marginalized thing everything you know is just very well tied together the rotting at the extremities all of it, it it's a it is a very well put together piece of art i personally found found it half an hour too long i i just i hate this thing where hollywood movies are just getting longer and longer and and i just i would rather two movies than than a two-hour film or something um but that would be i would be yeah. curious if you watched it again if you would do like i did and and yeah, and it, it, it might be a structural issue you're exactly right it might be a structural issue that once i see them going into what feels like act three uh and and i know that um uh, that uh, there's there's a wonderful writer recently who said I hate it when people talk in screenplay terms. You to- I'm totally down with what you're saying. But nevertheless, when I see it, what it feels like it's going into Act Three, and suddenly 
we've got a whole nother sequence, I feel out of balance. But that's me, you know. No, but, but I I, I yeah. understand. I know, like like yeah. I said, when you when you talked about it, I knew exactly yeah. where you were coming from. Yeah, and it has that feeling. I, I would be curious if you revisit it. Yeah, feel yeah. The same. No, that's a that's not a, that, not that you have to. Of course, yeah. you should always feel like you feel. I mean, by by no stretch of my trying to say like ah oh, you don't understand. no 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 yeah uh and and we on this show we definitely have left room for for us to to dislike or, or like films i really admire this film a lot you know i wasn't totally in love with it but i but boy does it accomplish a great deal so cool uh let's get endorsements i'm dying to know like what you people have been like loving this week and and want to express uh I have actually something that I'm just looking for. I haven't had time to do much other than edits, so it's been pretty sad. But uh, uh, so, Drew, do you have any endorsements for us? I have a couple of things. Um, one, because I, I feel like it, it ties into this, I want to throw out another round of praise for DC Comics. Uh, they, they did a Justice League Doom Patrol crossover called Milk, War, Milk Wars. Uh-huh. And... Um, you know, I actually feel like it ties into a lot of what this movie ties into. It comes at it a different way because it's a superhero story, of course. But uh, there is a line in uh, in in the, the last chapter that came out last week, and I think you should run down to your comic book store and get it. But there's a line that says, oh, well, you, you feel like a monster. Well, we're, we're the ones that are saying that it's actually okay mm. to be a monster. Uh, and I thought that that was such a lovely... Uh, <laughs> lovely summary of what the doom patrol is yeah. about when and you know how how they have uh helped me there's some some hard time in my life and uh you know as as a uh, as a comic fan I've, I've occasionally made the uh like i feel a certain kinship with 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 uh, uh both crazy jane and uh and uh, Cliff Steele a lot, and I, I just, I think this was a wonderfully done crossover. It's very absurd uh, and and very uh, thought provoking at the same time. I also wanted to uh, to thank Jason for something that he recommended a long, long time ago, which was mm. uh, Doctor Terrible's House of Horrible, yes. uh, <laughs> which <laughs> is essentially Steve Coogan. <laughs> Yes. Anthology. Uh, Lee, uh, there's with one season. It's on Shutter right now, um, which is a, an extra channel you can get on Amazon Prime. And it's essentially uh, the British comedian Steve Coogan who's doing these very thought-on parodies of British horror films from the uh, the 60s and 70s, um, and they look so authentic that if, I think if I had the volume down, I don't know that I would know that they were fake. Particularly uh, the the uh, the Hammer one and then the Amicus uh, anthology movie parody that they do. Oh uh, my God, the, the the Amicus one looks so much like a Vault of Horror that that it's mind blowing. It, it's it's whoever, really yeah yeah. Whoever is the production designer, whoever was the production designer, they did their job right. Like they they nailed the look of these movies and. It's funny. Most all the characters talk in double entendres the whole time. It's it's very 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 ridiculous because it's British humor. So I think you have to prepare yourself for that. But uh, if you have Shutter, uh, you could watch the whole thing in the afternoon in, in one afternoon if you uh, if you have uh, nothing else going on. And if you're a big horror fan, particularly if you're a fan of Buff Hammer and Amicus, you'll definitely get more out of it. But highly recommend it and again thank you jason for for suggesting that i don't know how many episodes ago that it was that you recommended that to me but i finally got around to seeing it and uh, i really enjoyed it i'm really glad i've only watched a couple of episodes of it and i'm glad because i I'm, I'm i almost am afraid of watching the last like three i watched like three i haven't watched about three and i almost don't want to because i don't want to run out of it you know and that's going to happen as soon as i watch the right is that i know that makes no sense at all i don't know if you've ever had this 
thing where you're like uh, no if, some things you want to ration i totally i totally yeah. get it i did not <laughs> <laughs> but, but i only have one episode left that that i i need to watch oh they do a they do a parody of mad love actually where it's instead of where it's the guy's hands it's, it's a, a guy's feet hysterical right. i just i don't I know hope. i uh i can't i can't i i wish there was more of it so so well done steve coogan yeah no he's fabulous fabulous uh cool jamie do you have anything uh to endorse yeah i actually was all about uh the new season of jessica jones oh um i know it's a show that's a little dark for people um and the season's still pretty dark um dealing with some mommy issues and whatnot then uh you know there's a a lot of uh good stuff to be had though that's in the season so far and um uh, well i've Saying if you're feeling, you know, the eyes that the eyes of March are upon us, uh, you know, maybe give it a go. But actually, I think we're past the eyes of March now. So, you know, <laughs> but if you're feeling good and chipper enough that uh, some depressing shows won't bum you out too much, then give it a go. <laughs> Drew always teases me that I I love like downer shows. I'm terrible like that. So sure, it's true. She really does love. Depressing yeah. TV and movies. But it's yeah, I love depressing movies and and, and, so. and occasionally depressing songs, really. And usually, yeah, it's, and it's one of the reasons why I've always liked Guillermo del Toro. Like, most sure. of his movies are pretty depressing as well. You know, you should check out "Don't Look Now." That's a really neat film based on a Daphne du Maurier book that's very somber and sad, and also kind of horror, but kind of just psycho psycho thriller but but not fat it's not fast like that it's a it's you know if you like bummer horror that's um one of my favorites i don't know if i would say necessarily bummer horror specifically i just i like beautiful and yet depressing movies <laughs> like life is beautiful is my favorite movie sure like, well one of my favorites you know yeah no i can i can dig that, I like that don't, look now, <laughs> don't look now don't look now Short, short version, beautiful film. Uh, Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie are mourning the death of their daughter who died by drowning. And so they move to Venice to rebuild an old church because naturally what you do to get over yeah. a trauma about yeah. drowning is move to a city mostly made of water. And they <laughs> they go there and I immediately, the yeah, and work on a church and there's a uh, a little creature chasing them maybe it's a it's a very strange film um and also has a hell of a sex scene between uh donald sutherland and julie christie um uh, just <laughs> all right just Good to know. famous so uh okay <laughs> that could be my endorsement for the week uh <laughs> tony tony save me from what, what do you have <laughs> um like i I don't know. It's been a weird week and I don't have much. Although I will say um, on the music front, one of my favorite bands that I has leapt into my faves uh, after seeing them live, uh, Freedom Hawk has a new album out this Friday. I think it is March 23rd. So yeah, uh, Freedom Hawk and they have a video up and everything. Um, they're really great dudes and make really great music. And that's mostly what's been keeping me going over the past few weeks. Because things are just weird and dumb. So <laughs> music is the universal solvent for me. So I am going to say uh, listen to some Freedom Hawk. And if you dig what you hear, get their album out on Friday. Because I think it's going to be awesome. Wonderful. Wonderful. I actually, um, now I have to go back and watch Don't Look Now, by the way. Because, God, what a beautiful <laughs> book. And what a beautiful movie. It <laughs> just... like, God, what a beautiful sex scene. <laughs> and it is, yes. Well, that's like world famous. Because, no fish um, involved. No, no fish involved, and uh, uh, but there is Donald Sutherland. It, it's uh, there's it there's just fish. all kinds of Hollywood legend about about <laughs> that. So if you want to um, look that up, um, don't do it at work. I'm not talking about the scene itself, but the filming of it. <laughs> this Jason, is you like said, you said save me, but yet you have continued to, to firmly grasp the golden shovel, <laughs> turn it into a backhoe, and continue on. And All right. to you, sir. Yes. Okay, now check this out. Check this out. I'm actually looking for something. The, 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 uh, my, I don't even have a, an actual endorsement because I swear to God, I, I have two books that I've been trying to, to turn in the edits on, and it's made me really slow in everything, and so I haven't really gotten to watch anything, and I'm sorry. But 
I was reading today about the uh, 1977 novelization of The Creature from the Black Lagoon uh, that I really want to get my hands on. And um, it's just a rarity. I mean, basically, they go for like 100 bucks each, you know, and, 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 and I don't know. If you have a copy, I'll borrow it from you and send it back. Or, or, and and uh, I just really want to read this thing because apparently it is bonkers. It, it has the cover of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Uh, uh, with Julie Adams on it and the, the Rico Browning creature and all that. But the creature described inside is totally different. He's got, he's like pink and, and giant, like the size of a boat. And, you know, and he squishes people. It, it's like, it's like Ramsey Campbell, apparently writing under the pseudonym of Carl Dreadstone turned, wrote a book, I guess, inspired by creature from, from the black lagoon. And then for whatever reason, the publishers decided, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to, call it creature from the black lagoon and and it's it's apparently amazing so i gotta get my hands on this thing you know and and in many of these cases these novelizations that came out like 30 years ago uh you just can't find them you know they don't exist they aren't digitized they only exist in you know yellowing paperbacks you know which in many cases there are only a few left and that just um, there seems to be a growing market for it like i have a lot of friends scattered throughout the, the country that that love buying novelizations of of movies like sure. like and i mean more power to you you know and in, in this case i totally get why this is a curiosity but yeah. for the most part like i just i don't have the energy to read a novelization no but of, drew of a movie but drew before you got to remember so i think we talked about this before i can't remember anyway let's pretend we have so, go ahead so the novelizations Let's let's take the novelization for of Alien, for example. Mm. They they need to get these out because they need to be out at the time of the movie to be relevant because you're gonna want to buy that. At the time most of these came out, it's it's changed. There was no VCR. Like VHS, like you couldn't rewatch a thing. So also they left it a lot of times it was really pretty good writers. And since they had the original script, the the novelization for Alien and Aliens actually are the director's cuts. All the stuff that they've added back to like the Blu-ray or the director's cut that you might get on the VHS at the tail end of VHS, et cetera, all that stuff was in the novels because yeah. they had the original script. And those were the only ways, like, I have dog-eared copies of, like, Tron. Sure. I even have, randomly, because I just read voraciously when I was with my grandparents in the summer. I think I somewhere I have the novelization to Annie, of all things. Which oh, I, thing. man, I love, I, I, I so love like, the whole world of novel. Like, I had Clash of the Titans, boy. Oh, First man, of all, and, that one, and they all had pictures. So if you what, a have, gorgeous, I, what a gorgeous, what a gorgeous paperback. I don't, I don't know, was. though, like, I... I like, like like my buddy John uh, just posted, uh, so he, he found a, a used bookstore, the novelization yes. of Francis Ford Coppola, Bram, Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> not not just a movie edition, not a movie edition, <laughs> you know, of, of no, the original no, I know novel Dracula. Mean. And I, I look at that and I just like, why not just read Dracula? Yeah, but I would buy that. Yeah, but because it's, it's because fun it's to explain. <laughs> That it's like James Bond's Moon, James Bond's Moonraker, or James Bond and uh, you know the Spy Who Loved Me, which are novelizations of the film that are, of course, because those films had nothing to do with Ian Fleming's Moonraker or Ian Fleming's The Spy Who Loved Me, and they were special novelizations. I love, I love it when the novelization gets complicated. That actually makes me totally happy. <laughs> Also, the the uh, uh, novelization of Nightmare on Elm Street, it's a three, it's like all three movies in one novel. Mm -hmm. But the version of Dream Warriors is like the first cut of the script. Wow. And it is a vastly different like Oh, and that's and that's often the case as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you know, like reading that, it's a total it's like watching this weird, crazy alternate cut of Dream Warriors that never made it to screen. So more, more, I, I, I challenge more, you, Dream more, Warriors, yeah. I oh, challenge you to read Alien for one uh, and Nightmare on Elm Street because you can. Probably, I think you can find that. I, I believe They're Alien is incredible. also by Alan Dean Foster. By yeah. the way, if you want to read about these things, and this is another endorsement, there's Are a you blog. You guys giving me homework assignments? It kind of feels like you're giving me homework. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if you're gonna, get if you're gonna be all rude about it, I'm gonna you, tell but, you. That I if think you, I think you're giving. I'm not sure. being rude. I said no, more power to you. I said yeah, you yeah, want to yeah. do it. I just said I don't get it. 
Yeah. Well, what I'm well, saying is, if you read those two, and I think you might be on the way to getting it. And if you don't, that's completely cool, of course. Well, so but, Tony's deeper than me. I just like to look at the vintage uh, covers and stuff like that. Having said <laughs> that, uh, uh, this this 1977 creature, I want it because no, 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 no that I get, that I get, because that sounds crazy. I yeah. uh, that that one I totally understand. By the way, that the. the um, the Choose Your Own Adventure book of Staying Alive, the sequel to, <laughs> to uh, Saturday Night Fever, that oh. is a novelization. In Tony, its- that was the <laughs> not even a novel- finest, <laughs> literally the finest birthday present that you ever gave me was the novelization <laughs> of Staying Alive. I, I, I really, I'm. Well, what is the name of the Broadway show they do? It's like. Alleys of Hell. It's like no, the, something Satan's with Dante. Alley. I thought. Satan's but anyway, Alley. But, right. yeah, Satan's Alley. But but it's a choose your own adventure book based on Stay Alive, which is even more random and insane. Mm-hmm. Like it, I've often just quoted that and like looked through it because it's just such a weird. Like of all the things you could choose, <laughs> make chose the 80s modern dance well look, oh, before I... streaming video and smartphones people had more time to read and so there was novelizations of everything there were like multiple multiple clueless novels clueless novels novels Probably about novels share that. getting into shenanigans <laughs> There were what novels. Was the TV show? Yeah, I mean, I guess they were based on the TV isn't, show. Isn't point. there like a, a stretch of uh, Friday the Thirteenth? Like there was a series. Young oh, yeah. adult. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I need to get those. Are the ones I actually wish I had a, a stack of. Listen, next time we're in town, we'll hit the uh, Fahrenheit's books in Denver. They have like uh, weird um, vintage paperbacks out the wazoo. We'll we'll, we'll figure this stuff out. So uh, anyway, by the way, too much horror fiction. That is the blog that keeps track of vintage horror fiction. This is not an ad. It just sounds like one. I just love this site, and they and they have just all this stuff. A nice uh, nod to the misfits of that name, too. Yeah, is it? Yeah. I did not too get much that. horror fiction. Wow. Driving wow, that blows my mind now. Okay. Well, I mean, he doesn't say that, but... It, <laughs> but oh, yeah. that's yeah i'm pretty sure I, I could be wrong but i'm i'm almost positive it's gotta be right so all right um that is it i really appreciate you guys spending the time to discuss the shape of water uh, i can't wait to hear what uh the crowd on the facebook page think and feel like we missed or 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 you know we're right or wrong about but either way we will we will definitely engage with all that. Um, Jamie, thank you for joining us. Um, everybody, have a fantastic week. I have no idea what we're back with next, but I have no doubt that it will be memorable. Uh, and and um, thanks a lot. Have a lovely evening. You too. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye.